drop it! Hello everyone, welcome back to Flet's Movies and Pop Culture 13, where we discuss all movies. I'm your host, Kyle Curtis Flett. Today, I'm interviewing a very special guest. He was the set decorator for Star Wars New Hope, the art director for Alien, and he's also directed the second unit for Return of the Jedi and The Phantom Menace, and he's done so much amazing stuff in his career. Academy Award winner, Robert Roger Christian, how are you doing? Hi, very uh, good to be here. Yeah, thanks for agreeing to come on. Um, I loved all your work, and this is going to be a fun time discussing your career, and it's an honor to have you on. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you as well, fellow Canadian at the moment. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so my first question to you is, where did your passion and how did you get into this industry that you're in as an art director and set decorator um it was kind of a accident in some ways i i wasn't sure what i wanted to do and uh, i certainly wasn't going to be what my father had ordered which was either a doctor a priest or an architect and um i was so broke put uh, I used to work in the summers and I was putting up these huge marquees and saw this um, prison camp being built. And I thought, what's this? I went to ask the guys what it was and they said, oh, it's for a movie and we're right next to Pinewood Studios. So I got under the fence because I couldn't get through security. And there was James Bond being filmed and the doors were open and it was like a holy grail moment for me that, uh, wow, this is something that uh, exists because I, I used to love going to the cinema and um, I, I went in the prop room and found all this stuff and gold bars that in fact turned out to be plaster. And I thought, wow, this is how they do it. This is amazing. I got to be part of this. So um, I wrote tons of letters. I was at art school, um, got no replies except for one who said one producer said, you know, you, you've done art school. I would suggest trying to get in through the art department. It'll be easier for you, but you'll need architecture. So I got into Oxford School of Architecture somehow and did two years there and then thought, and the, and the principal said, go and do what you want now because you'll be bored for the rest of the time here. And um, the movie that made me really want to be in movies was... Dr. Javago, I went when I was an art student, still very young, and saw this movie in the big cinema in Leicester Square in London. And uh, I kind of had an out-of-body experience. I was so overwhelmed by this huge, huge, wonderful movie and love story and, and everything about the Russian Revolution. It was all contained in one. I, um, I was so broke. I was living at home. No one was speaking to me because of what I was trying to do. And I sold my car in the next town. I thumbed a lift home and um, an architect picked me up and we got talking. And he said, well, one of my um, drafts people worked on this film, Cleopatra. It was such a massive film. They had... Um, taken people in architects offices anybody to go and help build all these massive sets and he said i'll ask him call me in three days so i did and he set me up with a meeting and i went to meet charles bishop who was doing a tv series department s at the time he looked at all my work and said listen i would take you on but we're just finishing the series i've set you up for an appointment in shepparton and i went the next day to shepparton and met john box who designed Lawrence of Arabia and Dr. Shivago. Um, and he looked at all my work and said, look, I'll take you on if you don't mind starting as T-boy. 
um, which was fine by me. And so there I was. And my first job was for the designer. I kind of revered his work. And um, John mentored me. And the next offer that came up was from Charles Bishop, the art director who I first saw. And it turned out he was the art director who built all the ice palace on Dr. Zhivago. And he took me on on Randon Hopkirk, Deceased, which was a huge cult TV show. And I started on the drawing board because that's where I come from. The um, set decorator had, a, 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 unfortunately, sadly, had a mental breakdown that the pressure on us making those TV series on the money that was available was pretty horrendous. But I was, they offered me because Charlie saw that I was bored on the, on the drafting table and saw something much better kind of for me to do. So they offered me to set decorate and that was it. I just zoomed forward from then on. Awesome. And so how did you get involved? How did you get to meet George Lucas? And, and of course, congrats, you won Academy Award for your work on New Hope. So how was it like? making something groundbreaking like that um that was very interesting because i was um i was called out to a help at art department with the designer john barry on a huge movie called lucky lady it was massive um <clears throat> and we were building sets out of old mexican buildings and dressing them um and this film had big stars had um Liza Minnelli, Gene Hackman, and Burt Reynolds, who was number one at the time. And um, what happened was George Lucas had been taken on by Alan Ladd. Each of the studios at that time were not doing well, and they all decided they need young talent. So Universal got Spielberg, um, MGM took on, I think, um, uh, Coppola and each studio took on a young director. Sorry, I can't, I'm blanking on who they were at the time, but Alan Ladd banked his, um, his future on George Lucas and George Lucas came into him with his worst nightmare because science fiction was completely devoid of any box office interest at the time. And he came in with a children's sci-fi fantasy Alan Ladd kind of went along with it. The, the studios didn't. So they analyzed how much this film Star Wars would make, which was $12 million. That was their analysis. And in those days, they divided that by three. And um, they gave the filmmaker a third of it. So they said to George, if you can make your movie for $4 million, we'll make it. The budget was eight. Uh, Gary Kurtz had searched America and Los Angeles. There were no stages free. UK was half the price exactly of America at the time. And um, we had stages completely free around London. And Lucky Lady was written by Gloria and Willard Hike. Now, they'd written American Graffiti and were dear friends of George from college. And they'd helped him on Star Wars with some of the... Um, character development and dialogue so they suggested george come down and meet john barry and myself which he did i was i was um shoveling salt around a salt factory we we kind of created on an old mexican building which was for an action scene and george arrived with gary kurtz just the two of them and george told me about this science fiction spaghetti western he style he wanted to make as a science fiction kind of saturday morning cinema and i was quite honest because i really hadn't connected to any science fiction movies before but i was an avid science fiction reader um and i told him you know i i think of science fiction as used and and you know, you take a ship, it's like a car that's dripping oil and being repaired and everything. So I didn't know at the time, but I was exactly describing the Millennium Falcon. Um, and George, we had dinner that night with John, and then I heard we'd been hired and, and uh, we had to go to England. 
on August the 1st to start work. Now, Fox had not committed because they still hadn't got the budget down. So when we arrived, we were given the script to read and told that the budget was $4 million overall. And then we looked at the script, John, and I thought, wow, we can't do this. And I thought, well, but it's a dream job for me. So um, we kind of found a way to do it. He took George to Tunisia and showed him the ancient architect. And there was Tatooine, exactly as Ralph Macquarie had described it. And I decided I couldn't build anything or do anything. So um, George, with his own money, set John and I and one art director, Les Dilly, up in a tiny studio in London for four months while they wrestled with the budget and worked out how we could make this film. Um, and what happened was John Barry, he's just, he's unfortunately passed away very early, but um, John was so supportive and he realized if George didn't have R2-D2 working, there was no film. You know, they're the two stars of the film. They're the storytellers. There was no way to make him. There's no CGI in those days. There was very limited radio control, and we kind of referenced the Daleks in Doctor Who, who had people inside them. So we thought that's the only way to do it, if we could make it work. And so those four months, we set about making... Um, I found a wooden kind of, uh, sorry, I found a carpenter, Bill Harmon, who made all the Monty Python um, films, and they had no money at all. They couldn't even afford horses on the, on the King Arthur one and had to use coconut shells. So Bill had some wood at home because Robert Watts, who was the production controller, said, they've given us no money. I've got nothing to give you. And so Bill had wood at home. I found an old lamp top in a in a junk pile, and uh, it fitted. And we stuck that on the top, and we developed it around Kenny Baker, who was three foot eight tall, um, and eventually got him to walk in it in the two legged mode. Um, and I, at the same time, I went off and thought, you know, the guns in science fiction films were my worst kind of peeve because they were all plasticky and made terrible sounds. So I, I had thought if I just rent guns, World War II guns, which I think to me, like a Sterling is a science fiction gun anyway. So I went on my own. I didn't tell anybody. I thought I better see if this works. So I made a... a the blasters for the stormtroopers with a sterling and i got some tea strip from a car and stuck that around the barrel and um found some uh war they were from the um uh, army in in uh, ireland they were long range sites they could see at night and i stuck those on the top and thought wow this is pretty cool and uh, then because george kept talking about a, a western hero which was han solo i found this mauser the german gun from world war ii which i loved the look of and it had a wooden handle and i did the same i stuck some bits around it stuck a piece on the end and called george over um and told john barry you know i'll either be fired now or hired because this is how i think we should do it and i can rent them and it, it cost no money and and we didn't have time to um to, to prepare anything because they had to shoot in March and Fox finally greenlit the movie in right before Christmas. So we started in January. We only had two and a half months to get this whole huge, huge movie prepared. So George loved them. He stayed with me. And in fact, he got his fingers covered in super glue. We made Princess Leia's gun together, sticking it round a, a, a target pistol. That's the kind of short story of how warmth it went from there. Awesome. And what is your most proudest work on work on working on that film? Um 
two things mainly. I, I, I liked everything about it because I was just I was just presenting George. There was no time with one thing after the other. I I got the idea because we didn't have any money to build the sets and I didn't have time to break down scrap aeroplane junk that I could buy very cheaply. I could buy half an aeroplane for 50 pounds. And so building up the layers after we did the cockpit first and it worked and I did the hold, which to me was where the whole look of the ship would really be seen. And I think that set to me from us with prop boys, you know, and I, I had to teach them what to do. They used to putting chairs and sets and tables and curtains and stuff. And I had to teach them how to break down airplane junk and make it look right into a set. And it looked terrible while we were building it. And I was praying no one would come and think I was mad until we got everything encrusted in there. We oiled it and made it look aged suddenly I saw people coming around the set with eyes wide open thinking, wow, this is like the first spaceship they'd ever seen, real. That set to me was, you know, of course it went on to Alien as that kind of procedure that I kind of invented in a way then. And, of course, the lightsaber, which when I read the script, because I was a huge fan of King Arthur, and when you think of King Arthur, you think of Excalibur. That's what, you know, as a kid, I played sword fights all the time. So um, getting that as a kind of suitable object that was mysterious and mystical for a Jedi weapon and finding a, you know, a camera part that I could stick my T-strip from the blasters on and make it work... And it's become the icon of Star Wars, which I thought when I read the script, if anything does work with this film and it goes out and, and becomes successful, <laughs> that will be the icon of Star Wars, this lightsaber. And I, I think, um, yeah, it's it's kind of served its purpose over the years now. Definitely. And, you know, and it's been a very long time in so now Star Wars is still iconic, and people love New Hope, the original trilogy, of, of course. And and then your work still lives on, and it's still amazing. And, and congrats to you on working for winning an award for that because you made you did an outstanding job on that. Movie. Yeah, thank you. And I, it just I'm very proud of that first one. It's a perfect myth. It's it's you know I, I really embrace Star Wars and I do a lot now with fans and everything because he gave the world something to believe in when the world really needed something. Um, you know the story is yeah. it's it, it's as George says he makes the films for nine to twelve year olds and it's it's not his fault that adults like them as well. But it's caught, it's created a, a, a tremendous kind of conversation and communication link between parents and children. I get it all the time now. Of that's the one thing that they can kind of break the ice in a modern world of TikTok and social media and kids and iPads and everything. There's a huge kind of breakdown of communication and star wars has been a common denominator throughout the world of a way to you know bring people together and it's changed people's lives just just being fans of it and um, embracing it and I, I think george gave the world something really really that will be um, remembered forever Definitely, because you know, Star Wars has went down generation and generation. It just keeps gaining fans as yeah. it goes, and and I still love the franchise since it came. And Star Wars: New Hope is definitely one of my favorites. And and you know, look at that. It's now that you know, the lightsabers are merchant or you know, merchandise and you know, toys for kids. The play, you know, toy lightsabers. It's just amazing what it has become now. Yeah, well, I've got a 10-year-old, and uh, he's <laughs> really filled, and he's got lightsabers. And it wasn't because I kept it quiet. What I did, he he's come to Star Wars through his friends. And um, now, of course, he's he comes with me to uh, 
we, there was a lot of events here in Canada in the summer, and I thought I'll go and do those. And uh, my son came with me, and uh, he he thought he then he thought he landed in heaven. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's even installers is even in video games too. So it's yep. amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's very um, yeah, it's wonderful, you know. And it's that 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 it's like a perfect myth has been created for the cinema generation. Definitely, for sure. What's up, Rosie? She's saying hi. Oh, hi. Uh, she's very excited to have you here. Thank you. Um, um, and then we also got Jason from Backtrack Cinema. He says your work on Aliens fantastic. Very good. I'm All glad. Right, you know, it's it's. Um, we we had a never give up kind of um, mentality. Because um, so I I wrote a book about it because no one's ever covered it. It's none of the making of Star Wars official documents have ever mentioned even our names because I'm the only one with all the stories. So uh, the last line in my book says, "Don't let anyone tell you you can't. You can." And getting Star Wars made and even Alien was beyond a struggle it was beyond believability but we did it we stuck by george and we got it done and i think that's something that is a message to everybody in their lives and it doesn't matter what you're doing it just do it to your best you know and try to, to remember there's no failure failure doesn't exist in my life if it doesn't work you analyze why and it's how you deal with it and you go out and deal with it a different way and i think that's the message in Star Wars. Definitely for sure. And if you have a passion for something, just keep pushing towards it. You know. Yes. And hello, Cody. Um, catching up on comments. What's up, Gina? Rosie says it's amazing to hear the beginning stages of Star Wars. We had yeah. no, literally no money. No? Wow. No, when, she, I'm, to put it in perspective, the, the prop master, the big one, uh, Frank Bruton, used to do David Lean's movies and um, he, he did Kubrick's movies. He was used to massive, huge films. He organized them like an um, army. So he, he came down to me and said, what do you want, boy? I was so young, he called me boy. Um, and uh, I said, look, I need you to strip our crop, your prop room out. I don't want anything, just metal shelves. We're going to get junk in here and uh, break it down, and that's how I'm going to make all the sets and stuff. And in my room, I was collecting anything I could to um, to find objects to make the props from. And the day that this huge, I think it was a 16-wheeled low loader, backed into the stage. He was standing next to me, and on it were jet engines, Rolls-Royce Derwent engines that were scrapped with roped on, high on. And he didn't look at me. He just said, you know, you're mad boy, don't you? And it kind of sums up everything. <laughs> but bless him, and he was one of the very few people who stood by George and myself and John Barry on the film, he said, okay, boy, tease on in my office. I want you there in five minutes. You tell me what you want. And, that, you know, I explain I need tools to break down junk and stuff. And um, that's how we did it. I, I think it probably sums up, best of all, <laughs> the atmosphere because none of the crew knew what we were doing. They, they honestly... A lot of them were vocal, saying it was a pile of crap. They just had no belief in it. But in England, if they took a job, they did it. That was it. So there was no matter of what we were doing had any credibility. And they were pretty vocal against George in what we were doing. So it was a kind of fight that went on and a, and a sense of belief in what I was doing for George and George and John throughout the whole thing. The director of photography was very alien to George the whole way through. He just didn't like him. But stick to your guns, you know? <laughs> 100% definitely, for sure. And hello, Emily. Um, 
Rosie says, you, you, you have created incredible iconic sets and props, Mr. Christian. Truly thank you for all your amazing work. I'm very grateful that you like them, and uh, you know it's it's. I I do so many here, it, it, as I said, I've done in America, but I was doing them here in Canada, and um, it just to see the kind of hope and pleasure and the the kind of immense kind of. Um, um, interest from the fans and how much they've given their lives when they often didn't have much to go on you know times were always difficult it's um to me that's the reason why i i've kind of carried on doing it and the reason why i did it um i've had people in tears when i'm signing a lightsaber for them or doing stuff it means a lot to people and that is very very important about this so it was worth the struggle it was worth um clinging on to my vision of what i thought which exactly matched george lucas's that's you know that was the big thing that kind of made it happen um and i like those i love the first one obviously i like the others that i worked on and i still appreciate what's going on with the whole universe it's growing and growing and i think they're slowly pulling it back into what george intended in the first place for sure and so return of the jedi which scenes did your second unit direct i did um i did they didn't have time on the first unit to film Harrison Ford as Han Solo coming out of the carbon freeze. So I got to film that with Harrison. That was pretty uh, good for me. Um, and I got 10 days of Ewoks, which <laughs> I was dealing with Jim Henson and puppets. And I was bossing Warwick Davis around. He was only 10 or 11 at the time. And I, I was had to shoot all the end, the party scenes, all of this stuff with him. And George obviously had his idea for an Ewoks film because he kept asking me to do more and more. And every time he looked at what we did, he said, that's great, do this, do that. And I kept saying, can't I just go and do some second unit, other stuff? But I ended up doing 10 days of those. So um, I did a lot of that and some pretty intense battle scenes I got involved with. Um, it, it was... Um, it was a joy for me being back and at the helm of shooting scenes with with uh, all the actors as well. Awesome. And and what was it like returning to Star Wars again for The Phantom Menace after all these years with George? Well, that was... I I'd met George. Um, they asked me to go to the ranch and I met Rick McCullum, the producer of those. Um, there was some there was some discussion over somebody in the art department who wanted a credit. And so I, I sorted that out with Rick. Um, and they said, come and see us in Leavesden. So I was back in London. So I went to see them. And um, I, I was the director of photography. I'd actually started off doing commercials in Rome. And he said, why aren't you doing second unit? This film's huge. I, George is never going to do it in 12 weeks. And, and the art director was the same. They kept saying, how do we deal with George? We don't know how to do it. And I was explained to them. So I went back to the office and I, I saw uh, Rick and I said, who's doing second unit? He said, oh, we don't need it now. We can, you know, we'll, George will reshoot a bit. Ben Burt's going to do a couple of days scenes and that's it. And I said, okay, um, just put my name down. <laughs> and uh, weeks later, they were well into production uh, prep. And I got a call saying from Rick saying, what are you doing? And I said, I was here in London. I'm, I was just taking a break. I just finished a movie in Vancouver and I had to go back and do all the um, color timing. And they said, can you meet, come and meet George? So I went up there and the two of them, and they said, were you serious when you offered second unit? And I said, yeah, I, I, of course I was. This is my world as well as yours. You know, I love, what being part of star wars so they said well could you start immediately and i i said well i'm supposed to go to vancouver so they looked at me and george said no 
um, you've got five minutes. You have to answer now, and you have to start right now. And they left the room and left me. <laughs> and um, so I made a quick call to the director of photography. He said, don't worry, I'll go to Vancouver and do it. Um, so they came back in, and um, I had described how I work with second units. I mean, George already knew me, but I described, because I was making movies then, how I handle second units who often wanted to impress the producers because they wanted to get a job and they weren't actually doing what exactly was required so i explained how i did that and george said get exactly what roger does get those equipment here and i said that yeah so i'm i'll start right now so they took me to a room and there was my secretary already there as assistant <laughs> They showed me what my first scene was, and then I understood, because George knew me and knew that I knew the Star Wars world, um, the first scene I got to shoot was in the Senate with the pods floating around. Oh, okay. And the uh, Rick explained that six times throughout the schedule, because it was so tight in 12 weeks, our second unit had to actually be the first unit. And so that was a first unit shot to set all the uh, lighting, everything. So it kind of made sense to me um, what we were doing. So basically, George had kind of divided the film in two. And we had the two Indiana Jones TV series crews, which were well kind of oiled by Rick McCullum how everything was shot. They were fantastic crews, both crews. So we had one crew each, and we just blasted through that film. It was, um, and in fact, I had to finish. George had to go back because the time was running out for the CGI because it was massive um, what they were doing. So I finished off the last week of Phantom Menace. I got to, um, in fact, I got to wrap. Uh, Ewan, I got to rap C-3PO, got to rap, um, I think, um, even some of the other actors. So it was an immense trust, but I, I knew the world intimately. Awesome. And so what was your mindset and uh, approach to Alien? Because that's a ground, that was amazing. You did amazing stuff on that movie as well. Well, I was actually on life of brian i was designing it with terry gilliam and um alien had started ridley had hired michael seymour who'd actually never done a sci-fi movie before but he knew him from commercials and and i knew ridley from commercials i used to art direct commercials for him and tony um and the financier lord delfont read the script of Life of Brian finally and said, I'm not making this. And he cancelled it on the spot. That afternoon, I went to London to meet the producers of Life of Brian and they explained what they were doing and they were going to try and resurrect it. And uh, I got a call from Ridley in the afternoon. He said, listen, you're free. Get your backside down to Shepherd and I need you. So I drove down and knowing Ridley anyway, I mean, he's 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 kind of got a camera for a head he's just his visions are amazing and um walking into this room with five or six giga originals around the walls and ridley was locked away storyboarding and they gave me the script i read it in like 90 minutes it was so fast and i thought wow this with ridley helming it's going to be amazing so i signed on immediately um and I understood why they, they'd hired a set decorator. It was a dear friend of mine, Ian Whitaker, who got Oscars for uh, films like uh, Remains of the Day and um, the, those beautiful period films they made. He saw me and ran up to me and hugged me and said, thank God you're here. I, I, I'm good at dipping curtains in tea and making them look old. What am I doing with all this junk? I don't know. And... Michael Seymour had hired a, a kid who'd never worked on a film before, who convinced him he could do what I did with all this junk. And It's not out of ego. It's just you have to know your stuff. And I'd worked on movies. 
so I looked at what he'd done and it was just not suitable. So I, I got my prop three of my team from Star Wars. They hired them immediately. And I got my buyer just to go out and buy. And this needed a lot more airplane craft than I had on Star Wars. So we got all of that in. And Ridley, how it started was he needed to have a set built to do a screen test for Sigourney Weaver. Um, obviously, the studios wanted a star in that part, and he had his mind set on Sigourney. So they um, they constructed, which was all there was at the time, they built wooden formers all around the stages, which were all of the interior rooms to come for Alien. And Ridley wanted it all built in one go. So they divided, they, they joined the two stages into one. And when you went into the set, you couldn't get out until you came out the other end. He wanted that claustrophobia and he wanted it for all those opening shots drifting around the ship. So I took the wooden former and I got um, scrap and pipes from drain pipes and i got the special effects boys to make up panels covered in crusted like we did and we made that section of corridor for ridley to see and uh, he did the screen test in there that's actually on youtube you can see that original screen test um, the only difference was they had portholes in the windows and they thankfully got removed because it, it spoiled the claustrophobia that Alien needed. But that was it. Then they just said, go, get this done, made as quick as you can. So I just set to work. And I inherited the bridge, which was my crowning achievement, I think, that that Alien bridge, the, the Nostroma. Yeah. Um, and there was a book written about it, my, my work on it, saying where well, I said at the time it was a monster of coordination, and it was just trying to get this thing built in that time. And again, you have to remember, this was the first R-rated science fiction film, so Fox were very nervous, and they even cut $600,000 out of the budget not long before shooting. Um, and that comes out of the art department because, you know, that's where most of the money was. So it was another pretty big struggle. And, you know, Ridley had only done The Duelist, so he was an unknown quality to the, to the studio exec. So it was another complete and utter struggle to get done. But in the kind of saving grace when you're doing it like that is they let you get on with it because they're just trusting that we could do our job. And, um, yeah, I, I really like that whole, I think we got that right, everything on Alien, the look of the ship and that feel of being in a what Ridley called a space truck. That, I definitely agree, and... And I love Alien. It's one of my all-time favorite films of all time. And, and you did an amazing job on that. It's um, interesting to, um, when you go back now, if you look at Star Wars, the first one, it still works. If you look at Alien, it still works. It, the aging of it hasn't changed your um, kind of view of it and it, it actually working and being feeling real. So, you know, because many films age, those two haven't. And I think maybe that's partly to do with the way that the vision of them was created and very aged and new and, and as real as we could make them. So I think that that works. For so, sure. And uh, all good. No worries. Um, yeah. Rosie's, got, Rosie's got a question. Did it yes. take many lights to create the room where Ripley communicates with Mother and the Alien? Huge <laughs> numbers of them, huge. And that, you know, those lights are difficult because they get hot. So um, uh, we had to find ones that would not burn so brightly. Um, I can't remember how many it was, but it was a huge number. Awesome. What's up, Mark? How are you doing? Um, 
What's up, movie homicide? He said Daniel Bannon's Alien by Ridley Scott is one of my all-time favorite movies because it makes you think what what if that actually happened? I also love HR Geiger's set design. Yeah, I think um I think it's right that um it it was again the first time that an audience didn't have to question. They're sitting in a cinema. When you're watching Flash Gordon, you're watching these fantasy exteriors fantasy costumes that have no relationship to an audience and uh, so you're not believing it i think both these films you didn't have to question it you know and, and as a as a production designer you've really successful if no one notices your work when people notice your work you haven't right. done your job properly because you're you've not done something that would kind of help an audience to appreciate the the drama that's going on so um i think you know and it's, it, they certainly it's true i mean every science fiction film since has used our techniques now and um and built on that for sure um rosie says that the feeling of the, the isolation in alien was well avoid yeah that was you know Ridley's idea and it was very very perceptive to set the whole ship that you went in on the stages and couldn't get out so you you were claustrophobic they were enclosed and those opening shots you know when he's drifting around the ship with the camera um, gives you that sense that it's alive but there's nobody there I mean just to tell you how this thing was made uh ridley wanted the papers fluffering when you're first going around there with the cameras drifting around there was oh, okay. no way to do it so i saw the hairdresser there with the hairdresser and I, with a hairdryer and i said give me the hairdryer i said ridley just tell me when they're working right you look through the camera and i got under the set and it was really i was getting hurt by the wooden structures and everything i squeezed in under started blowing the papers until he said that's it hold it and we filmed it that way and and the opening shot when the ship comes to life the first thing you see is the computer readouts in the helmet um, there was no way to do that again there's still no cgi nothing um and i've had worked on art installations using eight mil projectors so i said if you can get me a readout somehow um and we got a 16 mil projector in and i held it ridley got the cameras up it was just to experiment at this time this was a few days before shooting started and i moved it around focused it until suddenly there it was in the helmet reflected and ridley shot it and that's it that's what we used in the movie it was done the whole film was kind of done like that as well Awesome. So one of my favorite scenes is when they don't tell the cast that the alien comes out of the stomach. <laughs> that was quite the scene. <laughs> yeah, that was true. Um, and it's interesting how that's become kind of much more impactful. I, I ordered the, the buyer to go and get offal from the local. Uh, we had an abattoir in uh, Shepparton and we filled it with offal and they filled all the blood sacks and everything underneath it was very difficult to shoot poor john hurt he was ours and we kept him fueled with red wine the whole way through sitting there for hours and hours um and the first take Ridley had banned all the actors from seeing what was going on. And they were a little bit horrified to see all the crew dressed in plastic Max and uh, waterproofing around the cameras, everything. They were a bit like, what is going on? That first take, it didn't break through. It only pushed up the piece of the, um, of the T-shirt. And it kind of shocked them because he sent them away and ordered Nick Alder to put in a ton more blood and get the pressure and everything done. So when they came back, they were already disturbed because it looks pretty um, kind of frightening, just that 
lump coming up out of the chest, but nothing happened. And this time they're all going forward to see what was going to come next. And when that went out, it's true. I mean, Veronica Cartwright fainted. She dropped down <laughs> below the deck. And that's, that's real acting in there. <laughs> They were fed up with Ridley after that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's an amazing scene, you know. It 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 preys on the fears of everybody of something growing inside you. For sure. And then you know, and then and then of course the character Ripley was all by herself at the end of the movie and she has to survive and take down the alien. Yeah. So, I know. Well, you know, that George kind of invented the first female warrior hero with Princess Leia, who was a spiky, you know, princess who fought an empire. But he really created the first female um, ultra sci-fi warrior with Ripley. She, she just was great, I think, as a character. Definitely agree. Um, Rosie said, exactly, Mr. Christian, if you if you can create sets and props that fit seamlessly into the story, then you've done your best work. Yeah, that's it. And that's, you know, it's the same for every department, the costumes, the director of photography, everybody has to, what I call, play the same violin. And the violin is the director's vision. Right. So um, I just happen to have a kind of instinctive... Um, awareness of my well it was like a dream for me of how i think science fiction should be from reading you know the books that i read it, you know june was a favorite these were real worlds they weren't science fiction worlds they just were in the future but they were real and so my dream was to to make that world real in cinema and that happened to be the same vision of george and um ridley so destiny struck at the right time, at the right moment for, for all of us. Awesome. So you went to direct a film called Battlefield Earth. What was that experience like? It was, um, again, not easy because uh, the, the budget for that was $75 million and uh, they put Don Carmody in charge and he said we got 45 and I've got a way to make it we can do it in Montreal who'd only ever made art films at that stage French art films um, and I I was a I loved the book and I realized it was a chance to do something different because um, Ron Hubbard you know forget all the Scientology stuff I'm not none of us are George um, uh, uh, John didn't want anything to do with it in the film. And um, in fact, it, when you open the book, he says, Ron Hubbard, I know this will disappoint my serious fans, which means the fans of Scientology or the church. I just wanted to write a rip-roaring science fiction tale again. What is little known is he was the most prolific pulp fiction writer of his era. He wrote 48 books. And I saw this story as pulp fiction, but science fiction, pulp fiction. So um, we kind of set out to make it like that. And obviously I was a bit too far ahead of the, of the game. But again, we experimented with doing it. We made the film for that budget. Um, it's still kind of recognized as a $75 million film. In fact, I was accused by the LA Times of being illusionary that I thought I'd made this film for $44 million. It was obviously $75 million. I signed off the end of the film with John Travolta. The two of us had to sign the contracts where the final budget was stated, and it was only that amount of money. Um, and it was a huge experiment. Um, it changed the cinema industry in Canada, which I'm very proud of. We we were being called all the time. They were making, um, there was a, a huge movie, $100 million movie. They were stuck in Romania making and they were having a hard time. They kept calling to us to ask if 
it was possible it could be done now in Montreal. And we said, yeah, it can towards the end of it. And they did come in. And I, if I can remember that film, I will tell you. Um, and it started the industry. I brought in model makers who trained the entire team still working in, in Montreal. They're, they're world class now. And I used Canadian talent to do the whole thing. Um, and what's not ever spoken about for some reason is it's always said this film was a huge money-making disaster the last time i got reports it had made 150 million dollars it was um Ely samaho who was the financier made whole nine yards in in montreal and he made Battlefield Earth, he made another lot of movies and he said the only two that he really made a lot of money and out of was Battlefield Earth and Whole Nine Yards. So it's not kind of perceived correctly in that it's reported always as this huge failure. It wasn't. And in fact, you know, it, it only had a limited theatrical run, but when the Blu-ray and DVDs were released, they sold 600,000 in six weeks. Um, and in the UK, they outgrossed Gladiator, things like that. So there's a lot behind it that has we none of us could control or um, overcome this waging war against Scientology that people have. And I, you know, my when I first was doing the press about this, I said, America's a democracy. Everyone's allowed to follow whatever religion or whatever creed that makes it work for them. And John Travolta happened after a tragedy in his life, found that was the one thing that made him survive almost and has kind of kept his life uh, sane. So... You know, we're, we're, we're pretty proud of it, really. And um, a, a lot of people didn't go to it because they heard all this hearsay. And I, I'm constantly getting emails and reports from people saying, well, we finally went to see it. And you were ahead of your time. You were trying to do a kind of graphic novel style movie. And um, we, we didn't realize that actually there's a huge amount of kind of innovation in it. I just wish well, I could have done the second part of the book first, if if I ever had a wish, because the second part was was incredible. The fights in the air and jet fighters and things it was an amazing adventure. But anyway, it stands testament in time to um, um, a movie that even Roger Ebert reevaluated it before he died and said this is actually quite an interesting movie from being you know along with everybody decrying it when it first came out except for the italians loved it um, i got huge press in italy <laughs> awesome rosie said your visions have left an incredible mark in cinema history i apologize for forgetting if you won any oscars because you won an oscar for your star wars have yeah. You anything else since then? Um, I, I, George, George um, commissioned a short film I'd written as a thank you to me after Star Wars, and which I made as my first film, which is a film that's on uh, Black Angel, which is um, went viral on the internet not so many years ago. And because it was a kind of visionary um, movie that I, I'd kind of done to connect to the subconscious not the conscious because i had so little money to make it and i wanted to do something epic on it this i thought i'd better make a proper full dramatic short film next and i made this film dollar bottom which won the academy award for best dramatic short film that year when it came out unfortunately that was missing we cannot find the negative it's um i've got some um I've got some master tapes of it, so I'm going to try to get those converted. Well, that's unfortunate because I would love to see that short. <laughs> so it's a fun script. <laughs> it was a fun by a legendary Scottish writer. Cool. So you were also the second unit director on the Avengers of uh, 
Indiana Jones. So what was it like tackling that character, especially had to, it had to be the younger version of that character in the younger years? Um, that was very interesting. And in fact, that was at the end of, you know, I directed Phantom Menace. So the, 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 at the end of it, they kept saying to me, you've got to shoot some Indiana Jones TV series. And I kept saying, what have I got to do? You've got to tell me what it is and everything. And they finally came out. And when we finished shooting, then I had another week shooting doing Indiana Jones, the young Indiana Jones. And I had to shoot. What George was doing then was putting two together. So they became an hour TV. And they gave me <laughs> this one scene where he got on the boat where he was the younger Indiana Jones and he got off the boat and he was the older one. <laughs> so I said, how are, we gonna, how are you going to justify this? And George, he said to me, Roger, do you know the frightening thing? No one will notice. And uh, he said, they don't. I do all this sort of stuff and this is what happened. So I had to shoot this whole action scenes and everything in the desert, um, putting these together into, uh, in, into a, a longer version. It was fun, actually. Awesome. So, um, so what upcoming projects do you have that you're allowed to talk about? Well, I've the, the original Black Angel short, so it went out with Empire Strikes Back when there was just, there was no ads, there was no trailers, there was just a 25 or 30 minute short film and the main film. So... Black Angel went out in about 480 cinemas and um, I got letters for years saying, we remember you touched us, it got connected to us. And I eventually thought, you know what, it's better. It lies now because the negative had gone missing. George had a copy, his was missing off the ranch. They searched for two years. Mine I had, I was making this um, movie Nostradamus in Romania and I was directing commercials at the time for Boss Film. They went bankrupt. Now, in Romania, this was right after the revolution. We had one phone in the studio. We were making this huge movie. So I didn't know they'd gone bankrupt. Everything got binned, including my negative. There was no copies anywhere of it. Um, and what happened about six or seven years ago, I got a call asking if I was Roger Christian. I said, yes. And they said, did you make a film, Black Angel? And I said, yes. And they, which company do you use? And I said, it was my company. I got the money from the British government on a grant, but George commissioned it. And they said, we've got your negative. And uh, it turned out, I think, rank the big studios in Britain went bankrupt. And I think Universal Studios said, we've got room. And they took all the negatives from London there. So I got the negative and a few, literally a couple of months later, I got a call because Black Angel was written about in Wired magazine as they call them forget, forget, forgotten relics because John Borman had shown it to his entire crew when he was making Excalibur and saying, this is what I want. And George liked the way that I'd slowed the fights, which I'd did because I didn't have enough footage and I had no stunt people, nothing. I had to kind of make it work with a step printing technique. So he step printed the Yoda fight in the cave in Empire Strikes Back after he saw it. And Highlander um, went and used my same locations. And Game of Thrones, the pilot was shot in Scotland and was heavily influenced. So they wrote this whole thing about this short film of mine that I made for no money. And um, we got the negative um, restored. This second company called me and offered to restore it as a gift. And so they restored it. It was beautiful. And, and Skywalker Sound redid the sound, just to, just cleaned it up. And it went viral when I showed it at Scotland at the Glasgow Film Festival, because Scotland, it was the first time anyone had put on film this mystical, magical beauty of the Scottish highlands and everywhere. So they feel they owe me because the dollar bottom I shot in Scotland, and it got the first Academy Award for Scotland. So I was, they took it to the Glasgow Film Festival. That BBC online article 
got 500,000 hits in seven days and, and an Esquire magazine article, it went viral on the internet. And I was in a meeting on another film in London and they said, yeah, but what's this Black Angel? We've got to make that. That seven years later, I've now just secured the finance to make it. Um, so we're hoping to shoot in January and February. Um, and the thing was that I had to start rewriting the whole thing. And then I realized, you know, Game of Thrones took the kind of vision that I had of a wintry kind of landscapes and did it so well. They're so famous. Now it would look like I was copying them. <laughs> so I went back to my roots and I thought, you know, what I really wanted to do with this was make it like we made a spaghetti Western science fiction in the desert countries then of Tunisia, and I'd already filmed in Morocco, and I thought I could do a kind of spaghetti Western ancient epic. And that's what I've done. I've reset it there. Um, and I've got Toby Kebbell in the lead. I've got John Rhys Davis and Cheki Cario, who was my Nostradamus. Those are my three leads. They're all committed to the film. And we're now just juggling to get the time to make it as early as we can so i'm kind of basically in prep now that started this week awesome and you know and congratulations on the amazing career that you have and can't wait to see what else you've got in store in your amazing career that you have and yeah i, I keep just, going <laughs> for sure anything you want to say before we go off yeah, no, thank you very much for this. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also working on another project, which I was I just was in Hong Kong lecturing on Star Wars and AI and the web. And we are developing with an English producer a rather than like going on strike against it than this thing. I've realized that this ain't going away. And going to this conference, I realized that AA isn't coming. It's here on with a vengeance. I mean, it's being used everywhere that you have to embrace it. And it kind of freed up an idea I had that I wanted to pursue. Um, so I'm using the techniques now. AI, what no one realizes, it can only use what exists. The creatives still have to input it and still have to use it for their own ends. And that's where the creation comes in. So that's what I'm doing as well on the on the side of that that's really exciting too so thank you very much and um you know to everybody and all the fans and everybody who've embraced this world and um they can read about it on my book cinema alchemist it's on amazon and that i have a very good memory so i've portrayed every detail of how we actually made star wars it's, it's like a mentoring for um students anywhere actually and, and i included making alien and as well i thought let's cover the two in one that's called cinema alchemist and i called it that because i used base metal and got an oscar so i turned base metal into gold <laughs> which is what alchemy is awesome i would definitely love can't wait to read that um, what's up make a cat um, so I want to thank you, Roger, for coming on. It was a blast getting to know you and, this, and discuss to you about your career in film. And and I can't hope to have you back on again soon sometime. Sure, yeah. anytime. I, you know, sure. I love connecting, so that's the big thing. And that's what cinema is. It's a connector. For and sure. Star Wars is the biggest connector of all. I definitely agree. So, so I want to thank you for coming on. It was Not at all. For sure. And uh, I want to thank everyone who joined us in the chat and asked amazing questions as well. And I, I will be back tomorrow. It'll be my birthday stream. My birthday is tomorrow. So it'll oh. be a birthday celebration stream. So congratulations. Thank you. And I um, hope, you, hope you'll do something special. Oh, yeah, definitely. For sure. We'll do. Um, and and I will also have a video, some type of review dropping on either Saturday or Sunday. Um, so with that being said, I hope you all have an amazing, wonderful day. We'll see you all later on. Hope you have a great weekend and have enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you all later on. Bye, everyone.
Bye, everyone. Send me a link. Good.